Hello and welcome to the book club. Uh, it is the theater of one of the longest standing conflicts in India. Yet uh, the decades long movement in Nagaland doesn't get the attention that Kashmir gets. Most people don't even know about the nuances of it. The Eastern Gate, a book by uh, author and uh, journalist Sudeep Chakrabarti, uh, tells the troubled tale of Nagaland and the region, the simmering descent uh, that runs deep out there, its genesis, and how it has festered for decades despite various attempts to kind of uh, forge peace in the region. Sudeep joins us and he joins us from Dhaka. Sudeep, it's such a pleasure to have you, especially since we are looking at this book club as part of uh, the making of modern India. And you were so, so part of the journey of uh, rolling out the making of modern mm -hmm. India as the resident editor. So it's, it's a great pleasure to have you on the show. It's my pleasure as well, I Mini. Mean, it's, it's wonderful to be uh, on the show, especially as you said, as part of Making of Modern India. I'm very, very proud of it and proud as still to be in on it uh, as now a participant uh, right. from the other side, if you will. You know, Sudeep, I love the book, The Eastern Gates, because I've spent some time in the Northeast. I've always been fascinated by the area. But what I liked about it was it was a candid take as a journalist on what was happening over there outside the so-called official, you know, commentary that we get on that, which is safe and which is kind of, you know, uh, treading uh, carefully. Uh, you have made a very categorical point where you say that uh, the region has suffered from several decades of ignorance and uh, apathy, um, mandated ignorance and apathy. That's a strong statement. As a journalist who's been there on the ground, covered it, uh, written a couple of books around it and essays around it, how are you reading what's happening over there? How, what are the key takeaways that you've always believed? Well, uh, one of the key takeaways, uh, several key takeaways, uh, many, is that, and it began from my time in school and university. I mean, I mean, we never read about Northeastern India, which I dislike calling it Northeastern India. For me, I insist on calling it Far Eastern India, which I think is a more correct description. But, you know, let that be for, for the moment. There was no mention of Northeast India beyond the Brahmaputra River. Uh, no uh, mention at all. And it took several years after I began to uh, get into the profession uh, as a journalist and, and, and subsequently several decades at it when I began to understand the nuances as to why there was this ignorance and apathy. I mean, apathy comes from a great arrogance. It comes from several things. And I, I, I'm sorry to say, but the Indian government or several governments of India, several successive administrations from 1947 onward, and it continues to this day, perhaps not as much as before, have contributed uh, to, this, uh, to this ignorance and apathy. Um, and the great disconnect meaning began the midnight hour, literally in 1947, when uh, you had this region which was seamlessly connected as part of British India, from what is today Eastern India to, to what is today northeastern India through the bulk of present-day Bangladesh. And overnight, there was this sort of fist that was driven up through eastern India, as it were. And I, very, very physically, the distance uh, through the, uh, all that remained as a link between this far eastern aspect and the eastern aspect of India was this 22 kilometer long chicken neck uh, near Siliguri. Imagine, and here you could once go from seamlessly from Kolkata to Dhaka to Agartala in Tripura or to Guwahati, you no longer could. So I think it began then uh, where, uh, you know, where there was a great disconnect that began, very physical disconnect, as if it was somewhere elsewhere. It was never, it was no longer part of the administrative whole. And then when there were issues of identity that came up, there were issues of um, uh, autonomy that came up. and issues of dignity and self-respect, like any other part of India, where people in the north, south, east, and west were trying to reclaim their histories, reclaim their languages, linguistic heritage, and, and, and build a future for themselves. Uh, so you had Tamil Nadu come up, you had Maharashtra, then you had Gujarat, then you had so many other provinces come up, the United Provinces and then other states. But when northeastern India raised its issues about identity and autonomy and simple respect and dignity, uh, I think it was read more with a sense of paranoia in a very young nation that was being built 
literally brick by brick by people uh, like Mr. Patel, people like Mr. Menon, people like Mr. Nehru himself, uh, Mr. Pant, who was the Home Minister at the time, after Mr. Patel. So I think there was a sense of paranoia, I mean, which, which, uh, which was a reactive uh, governance rather than a proactive governance. And when people said that, you know, look to us because we have our needs and identities and we have our pride, uh, I think the interpretation or misinterpretation was that uh, they're trying to secede from India. They're trying to not be part of India. And the reaction to that was to send in, uh, you know, home guards and send in paramilitaries and then send, unfortunately, send in the Indian army against the very people that you were trying to claim as your own. Right. So it, it's the greatest of ironies, really. And that's where the, I think the disconnect begins and that's where the alienation begins. Right. Paranoia is a great word to use, <laughs> Sudeep, as we will see through the course of this conversation, because various attempts have been made. It's one step ahead, five steps behind. But, you know, I want to, uh, uh, and the one thing that you do in this book, as uh, uh, opposed to earlier books, because you've actually covered the, the genesis and the story of the, of the conflict in the earlier book, uh, Highway 39, over here, you actually center it to the present. And uh, a large part, I mean, at least the beginning, is about the framework agreement in 2015. And I want yeah. to quote uh, uh, Narendra Modi, the prime minister, at that meet, because I think in that uh, lies the beginning of our story on the Northeast, at least to understand it, uh, where uh, he uh, says at the time of the, of the signing of the framework agreement that the crisis in Nagaland is a legacy of British rule. By design, they kept the Nagas isolated and insulated. They propagated myths about them and spread lies about India. Now, this happened in 2015, uh, uh, Sudeep, uh, and many governments had attempted. There was a, the, 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 uh, the Kohima meet with Jawaharlal Nehru and his Burmese counterpart. There was a Shillong Accord. There were so many attempts. And yet to look back and blame it on the British, uh, and the, the seed of uh, dissent that they placed out there. I mean, I found it ironic. Of course, you can trace it back over there, but that's just a small sliver of the story, isn't it? Indeed, and in fact, I'm, I'm greatly surprised that uh, Mr. Modi hasn't actually blamed Mr. Nehru as well, uh, which, which is rather typical. But you know, here we're digressing perhaps, but I will come to that because the responsibility lies with all of us and all of them. Uh, yeah. There is some truth to uh, the British legacy, but it is an entirely administrative legacy. It is not a legacy of obfuscation, and it's not a legacy of uh, that British sowed the seeds of the problem. Uh, what basically happened in Nagaland, uh, which was part of the Twinsang and the Naga Hills district of the, at the time, uh, which were being administered, which was being administered by the British seat of government in the province of Assam, which was a very large province, which had broken away from the, which was hyped off from the larger Bengal administration by, uh, the, by the British. Now, the British saw this very much as a part of the British system of governance because it, it very much saw Nagaland and the Naga Hills and Manipur, and which had by then become a British protectorate and Assam which was a British province, uh, Eastern uh, uh, province of the Crown government, uh, pretty much like Bengal. Uh, they very much saw this, all of this, as uh, British, uh, you know, uh, the Indian part of the Indian Empire, very much so, including the Naga Hills uh, and and all of all of the other. Now, what basically happened is that when uh, the transition from uh, 1946 to 1947 and thereafter began to happen. Much like the rest of India, the Nagas too made a representation to the Simon Commission because they, they saw the writing on the wall. Everybody saw the writing on the wall, hence the Simon Commission in the first place. Uh, and subsequent representations were made where the Naga elders of the time, uh, 1929 onwards, made a representation saying that, you know, we would like to, you've let us be. Uh, and we would like to remain in the way that you've let us be. It was interpreted by the Naga elders at the time as a, as a kind of an autonomous region, an autonomous people, if you will, with a great sense of uh, identity and pride and autonomy, appearance. But the British saw that 
as essentially a, a hilly region uh, with numerous tribes, with many, many ethnic, ethno-religious, totemistic practices, you name it. And it was considered to be a region which was fairly difficult to administer. So uh, in a way, the British hold on parts of present-day Nagaland, uh, the Naga homelands of the present day, were light, but the British hold on much of the Naga homelands were also very firm because the British and the Nagas did fight and the British did have their HQ in Kohima. Let's not forget that. So it was not as if uh, uh, sort of the, the brand new government of India uh, in 15th August 19, on 15th August 1947 inherited something foreign. What basically happened was that like much of India uh, or, or uh, the subcontinent, uh, modern Pakistan and modern India or newly independent Pakistan and newly independent India and newly independent Myanmar subsequently uh, made a claim to uh, for territory and consequently the people in those territories. Uh, whether they were demarcated by uh, drawing a rough line on the map, which created partition, or whether it was a sort of a claim that was put forward later. So that is that is really what it, what happened. So the way the government of India saw it, the way the first government of India saw it, uh, led by Mr. Vallabhai Patel and Mr. Barrier Elwin, who was, to my mind, as far as Nagaland in the Northeast is concerned, was essentially a pamphleteer and a whitewashing agent for the government of India. Uh, he's done fabulous work in tribal parts of India. He's a fabulous anthropologist, anthropologist, but for Northeastern India, Mr. Elwin's legacy is very, very great. We'll come to that a little later, but this is the root of the transition, really, which uh, came to an interpretation, an interpretation by, like he said, she said, or he said, he said, where the government of India said something and the Naga elders claimed something else. And, and that's where the root cause of the problem lay. That's where Naga, um, the, the sense of Naga identity and autonomy began to grow. Uh, in the early 50s, it coalesced into uh, a hardline stance from both the government of India and the Naga uh, Council of Elders. And then, then it slowly coalesced into a conflict, uh, which was perpetrated by either side. Right. You know, the, the, the two big names that we need to cover over here. One is Mahatma Gandhi and, and, and the claims that uh, Angami Fizo made uh, to Murarji Desai about uh, the fact that the first Naga delegation apparently met, and this comes out in your book because I think you've quoted from one of the biographies uh, uh, of, of this meeting with Mahatma Gandhi and the elders from the Angami uh, Nagas, which is one of the powerful tribes over there. And they come and meet him and ask for freedom or, 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 or uh, their own land. And uh, they claim that Mahatma Gandhi said, I will fight for you. And days later, of course, Mahatma Gandhi was assassinated, so it didn't quite work. But on the other hand, you have another view, which comes from Nehru in parliament, where he says, how can I give this sliver of land, a small strip of land freedom, when China and um, uh, Burma are around it? And how can they claim, for, uh, claim freedom? So there, these two opposing views, you know, uh, which are very confounding, because it's very difficult to uh, look at either side without looking at these two things, mm -hmm. right? Indeed, and, and that's come to, that, that, that adds to the gray area meaning uh, of history. Uh, it's a very complex history, history in the subcontinent and no less complex in, in, in Northeastern India. So you have a situation where you have a claim from the Naga elders, which included tribes like the Angamis and other tribes as well. It was, the Naga elders comprised several tribes. They, they, they claim to have met uh, Mahatma Gandhi in Bhangi colony. Uh, mm -hmm. just days before his assassination. And uh, Mahatma Gandhi or Mohandas Gandhi, like many, uh, like a well-meaning person, said, yes, we will look after your interests because, I mean, he was a, he was a unifier in that sense. Uh, and so this is uh, sort of an urban legend, if you will. Uh, there is no record of it. It is something that has been spoken uh, numerous times by Naga elders and then by Naga rebels. And it's now part of the Naga rebel law and the Naga nationalist law, that this, this promise that was uh, apparently made by Mohandas Gandhi to the Naga elders saying that we will consider your wishes. Now, the, the, the com complexity comes in as if the same Naga elders 
when they were negotiating with Prime Minister Nehru and his cabinet and his officials, they brought up uh, the, the meeting with Mr. Gandhi, but they were also negotiating for what was not essentially independence, but essentially what was autonomy uh, within the superstructure of India. It's when the hardline aspects began to develop, when the positions began to harden, when, like Mr. Nehru, uh, met, met the Naga elders several times, not just in Kohima, he also met them when he was uh, campaigning for India's first parliamentary elections in the North. He met the Naga leadership then as well, and they were negotiating. The doors were not closed, Vinay. The doors were open. They were, uh, the interactions were tense and they were charged, but there was, there was no conflict. It was still two people, uh, two governments or two entities trying to come to terms for a mutually beneficial solution. Mm -hmm. And then the breakdown began to happen when uh, Mr. Fizo, Angamiza Fizo, is actually a key person along with some hardline elements in, in the Naga National Council who began to adopt a more hardline position. Now, it, it's open to interpretation whether these hardline elements were urged on by uh, the government in China of the time, communist government in China of the time, well, whether it was urged on by the, the government of Pakistan. I and mean, after all, uh, you had East Pakistan, which is present day Bangladesh, which is sure. entirely adjacent to Northeast India. So, I mean, that was open to interpretation, but the fact is that the Naga position began to harden. And consequently, Mr. Nehru's cabinet position, uh, cabinet also began to harden their position uh, to the extent that Mr. Nehru and his colleagues overruled the advice of his of colleagues in Congress from Assam who were urging continuously for years on end that there be no bloodshed, that there be talks, that this must be integrated, that there must be a peaceful solution found. But as you mentioned yourself, look at the complexity of China, you had East Pakistan right there, you had Myanmar, and Mr. Nehru is, wasn't unwise to these realities. He was very conscious of these realities. So he was balancing a new India, and which we, he was, it was still work in progress. He was trying to balance the needs of the Naga people and other peoples of the Northeast and the geopolitical entities, and very, very conscious after the conflict with Pakistan in 1948, uh, in Kashmir and elsewhere, 47, 48, that uh, there was going to be a great, great impetus and dynamic for uh, push and pull in the Northeast, like there, it was in, there was in Western India and Northwestern India. So it was an immensely complex cocktail yeah. of, of reality. It's a, it was a co complex cocktail, uh, Sudeep, and every passing decade adds layers to its complexity indeed, indeed. because it's a, yeah. it's, a, it's a work in motion, right? And that indeed, brings indeed. me to the point the, we will talk about some of the complexities because I think it's very important to talk. It's, it's very unlike Kashmir in that context because there's so many other factors and Kashmir is well known, this is not. But you know, there was a plebiscite that went against India as well over there. But the other complexity is the, the, the larger Naga land that they claim. Nagaland as a state came in only 1963, but Naga Lim, which they talk about, which is part in Myanmar, part in Manipur, part in the adjoining uh, states, uh, that's even more difficult for the Nagas to actually get to because there are other interests over there. That the the boat has passed, so to say, in that context. So that adds another complexity, doesn't it? How has it, the thinking you you've spent time, and I think you know what, what was uh, equally exciting about the book is your your lovely meetings with the with the yeah. Bell forces, and it, it was all quite exciting, but. Tell me, what is the thinking within them? Do they actually believe that something like this could happen uh, in the future? Where well, Naga Lim or Greater Naga Land was actually, uh, Naga Lim is a construct that is developed entirely by the National Socialist Council of Naga Land, which broke away in 1988, two factions. And then the IM faction, Isaac Muiba faction, uh, rechristened that faction as a, as they changed the nomenclature from Nagaland to Naga Lim, mm -hmm. uh, which is a greater Naga land which encompasses the Naga homelands, which are all contiguous and in both present day Nagaland, uh, uh, part of northeastern Arunachal Pradesh, uh, southeastern Assam, and northern Manipur, and northwestern Myanmar. 
These are the traditional Naga homelands. Now, after 1947, you had the lines being drawn and there was chaos uh, in this region, like there was chaos elsewhere in the subcontinent. Sure. I mean, that, that, that is part and parcel. But the Naga limb aspect, like the Naga homeland aspect, became more complex when uh, it became a territorial issue. Uh, you had uh, a situation, Naga land came into being in 1963 as a state. And you know the, 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 the interesting part is that, uh, and the ir irony of it is that for the Naga people, the 16th and now the 17th major tribe is a new tribe that has just been permitted to be recognized as a major tribe in Nagaland. After 1963, a strange thing happened. The Naga tribes of, of the territorial entity of Naga land, which was born in 1963, were quite content with Naga land. And the Naga tribes in Assam, in Arunachal Pradesh and Northern Manipur and Myanmar were emotionally, there was a link with them, but administratively and politically, the Naga people of Naga land were quite content to build up their own legacies and build up their own presence and futures politically, uh, economically, uh, and in every, every way possible, and let the other Naga brethren in these other territor territories be uh, pretty much left to themselves politically and territorially. So Naga Lim in that Naga homeland construct is actually a creation of one major faction, and that broke into several factions over the years. But it's interesting, meaning also that speaking in the present day, Naga, this greater Naga homeland is no longer a political demand of even the NSC and IM. They've moved on beyond that because they see the reality. They're looking at a settlement which will involve the Naga people as a whole, but uh, not Naga Lim because uh, the reality, the geopolitical reality, and the with it, with Myanmar and India, and the political reality within India, indeed within these four states of the Northeast, make it impossible at this present time. Maps change. Let's own up to that. But at the present time and in the near future, it it seems quite impossible that there will be a greater Naga land. So uh, I, I think the peace process is stuck with a certain degree of obtuseness on both sides, but I don't think it is to do with Naga Lim or this greater Naga land anymore. Uh, if, if it is being presented as that, it is being presented merely as an excuse. We can talk about that in, in greater detail. It is not holding it back. Uh, what is holding it back is actually a very brutal, blunt, cynical thing, which is how the government of India and its agencies will basically within a course of attrition, by a course of attrition, play out the Naga rebel process and how the Naga rebel leadership, all the factions, can retain the cream of the crop and the cream of benefits that they've enjoyed in decades worth of rebellion, which they've had at the barrel of the gun, and they're immensely wealthy Naga rebel leaders, some of whom are some of the richest people, not just in Nagaland and India, but in Southeast Asia. So, right. you know, I, I'm just that, throwing I, it out there, Mini. Absolutely. And that's a very important mm -hmm. point, Sudhir, because I've spent time in the Northeast. I've had, you know, I've studied with a, a lot of students from, 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 the, from Nagaland specifically. And I can, I also have found this ironical that it's at a time when there is so much, they, you know, there are other ways of looking at it. And, and you know, some mm -hmm. of it is not very, uh, uh, I mean, I don't know, it's not verified. But let's take a step back, you know, you spoke about this external factor because the sport has been stirred by many elements. It's not a simple, because Nagalit or, or the Naga tribes themselves are very complex. And we had a linguist uh, uh, just last month talk about uh, Nagamese and how, uh, you know, it's one of the youngest languages in India because- And a beautiful, beautiful, it's a rough a combination of Assamese and Bengali in a way, but yes. I love it. I, I, I speak it and I she stepped, she stepped okay. a little back and said, mm -hmm. But what is interesting is that uh, till very recently, two tribes couldn't communicate with each other because the languages were so different, you know, and, and that, that was also reality. But, you know, there are many people or, or forces that have stirred the pot, so to say. You have the Chinese, you have the uh, Myanmar, and look at what all has happened in Myanmar in the last uh, 70 odd years. 
and you have also have the missionaries and i found it also very interesting you have pakistan as well pakistan, pakistan was an active ingredient absolutely, yeah. absolutely. because so, mr fizo when he escaped uh india in you know when he finally escaped and went to kent in in, in the uk where he led a life of a sort of a expat rebel leader if you will uh, and and ran the rebellion which many naga elders they cry from a fireside in kent uh you know wearing tweed and so on and so forth no disrespect to mr piso but this is also a reality he escaped with the help of pakistan he he went to england uh, and he escaped with from south asia with the help of a pakistani passport so that too is true uh how is but, it uh, you were, i mean it, it's not a straightforward negotiation and we will come to the mizo accord of the 80s which seemed like a a, a quicker solution uh, not as complex a problem so my question is really in the context of how this is complicated it and and change the very essence of the movement well you know maybe but i you know before we move in, into a wider scope and bring in the mizo uh, accord which i'm very glad you did because i am a huge fan of the mizo accord but there were also certain conditions that were present at the time which permitted that accord to move move ahead in the way that it did but you know one of the most active ingredients and we must be conscious of that all the time and i would play this in kashmir i would play this in all other parts of india however much we might consider china and pakistan and myanmar to be active ingredients in the indian construct if you will and and also the uh, the post pakistan government of bangladesh because after all uh, the hardline governments of bangladesh gave provided active refuge to uh, uh, rebels in you know indian rebels as rebels from assam from manipur from nagaland from tripura from north bengal they, they were provided uh, refuge in in uh, bangladesh in training so on and so forth by the director general general of forces intelligence of uh, bangladesh for years on end that too is true but the main ingredient in the pot meaning which we cannot ignore is india Mm. without india being the mother lode if you will the main absolutely the main ingredient mm. in, in this in this sort of melting pot of chaos uh, and 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 many other things the other ingredients would not be able to play as much of a catalyst in the final product of chaos mm. that has been with us for so many decades now the the miso accord you you bring up in 1986 that is interesting and the miso accord a miso rebellion before we come to the miso accord let's talk about the miso rebellion because that's important very briefly the miso rebellion happened you know much like the naga rebellion and many other rebellions not just in northeast india but across india including in with the maoist rebellion and so on and so forth by as far as i see it by a lack of governance simple that's my interpretation by a lack of delivery of the criminal justice system by a lack of delivery of guarantees in the constitution of india which you and i take for granted but these were denied people over there there was a huge slippage there was a huge disconnect at that time and when the naga rebellion happened when the mizo rebellion took off in the mid 60s it was uh, these areas were administered by this mega government of assam so as far as i see these were administered out of guwahati so not new delhi so the the government of assam with in conjunction with the government of new delhi were directly responsible for administering this vast area of which was northeastern india mizoram was then the lushai hills yeah. uh you know meghalaya didn't exist it was part of assam manipur was a b category state and a c category state it became a state along with meghalaya You know, and it goes back to the point of yours, right? It was nothing but apathy and ignorance. I mean, these indeed, these, was, basic, these, indeed, these in, areas are in, so in, far in, apart from each other in terms of, uh, you know, culturally, indeed, in terms of travel. Indeed, but what worked for the Mizo uh, Mizos? In indeed, Mizo so uh, in, indeed, and the Mizo apart, uh, Mizo rebellion happened uh, just to close off that point because of misgovernance and and they, there was a famine, there was a very poor delivery of uh, relief. Uh, citizens demands were not met and and east pak pakistan at the time along with china were delighted to leap into the gap and, and provide the mizo rebel leadership which was led by mr baldenga who was a who was a peon uh, and i don't mean, mean to say this as a 
mark of denigration, my, my emphasis on the word Tian is not meant as a denigration of his station in life, but meant as how rebellions begin with this kernel, this just small seed, and then grow into this huge thing. And, the, and, and that's what happened. And it, it, the Mizo rebellion was rampant to the extent that the Indian Air Force was brought in to bomb Mizoram and the Mizo people. So Indian Air Force, unfortunately, it's a, it's a black spot. Under the government of India guidelines, instructions, strafed and bombed India's own people. We were the people we were claiming as our own. There was no peace overture. We bombed them. We strafed. Not a very pretty thought. The Indian Army didn't play nice. Uh, and we, we'll get it. We can get into that later. But to come back to the Muso Accord, I believe that because of a multiple uh, multiple factors, and they play. They're relevant, they're germane to the present day, to all accords that are happening in India, uh, and also the Assam peace process that is happening, the Naga peace process. Essentially, what happened is that East Pakistan, Pakistan became Bangladesh. The, the, very quickly, a few factors happened. The hardline government in Bangladesh, the Zia government, uh, General Zia, then General Eshad, then Begum Zia of the BNP moved into segued into the relatively more moderate India friendly as they like India's fond of calling it, the government of uh, Sheikh Hasina, which uh, has been extremely forthcoming to the in, government of India by actually literally rounding up rebels of various colors, including Naga, Assamese, Mizos over, over the years, and literally handing them over to Manipuri rebels and handing them over to India on a planter. That is, that is the truth. China has been distant because India's presence in the Northeast has become immense right now. You have three core in Dimapur, which is in line of sight of the camp head, headquarters of NSNI, right? The Eastern Command has positioned itself with missiles and you name it, targeted at China and Myanmar if need be. Two frontline air bases are, uh, are, 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 are sort of peopled, if you will, are stocked. Uh, with uh, SU, uh, you know, Sukhoi MK30, Sukhoi 30 MKI jets. Uh, the Rafale is positioned uh, over there. So, you know, strategically, India is looking at China. Uh, Myanmar and India have played off geopolitically. There's been a quid pro quo from the time before Aung San Suu Kyi became uh, the leader, if you will, of NLD and then a sort of a thing in Myanmar, where there was a quid pro quo with Myanmar in a way like with Bangladesh, where there was a hands-off element to India in Myanmar. In return, Myanmar entered into several deals with the government of India, uh, geopolitical, geoeconomic, geostrategic, which benefited India from the point of rounding up or neutralizing, if you will, some of the bases that Indian rebels had in Myanmar. They still do, but the influence is a lot less. So I think many of this came together, these realities came together uh, and they're continuing to come together. Uh, and the also a sort of a need to move on to see India, uh, Rajiv Gandhi in 1986, that was a brave new India, the first right. glimpse of brave new India. So I think the, uh, Mr. Daldenga and his colleagues in NMN saw the writing on the wall and they came on board and there was a huge, huge sacrifice meaning made by the Mizo government of the day, which was a Congress government. We cannot, I cannot stress this enough, which was a run, there was a chief minister in place, Mr. Lantan Hoda, who gave up his position as chief minister of Mizoram. This is in their meaning. We cannot imagine such a thing can happen in the present day. Mr. Lantan Hoda, for the sake of peace for his people within the construct of the constitution of India and the Republic of India, gave up his position when Mr. Laldenga, who was the, the, formerly the Mizo rebel chief, became the chief, the first, uh, the chief minister of Nagaland after the 1986 Mizo Accord. Look at that. Do the people of today in Nagaland and Manipur and elsewhere have the breadth and the depth of leadership, the sense of generosity, the sense of the future, the sense of identity and pride? that Mr. Lathan Hala and the Mizo people of the day displayed. And does the government of India of present day 
have this leadership, this sense of maturity to drive it? Or is it to be this sort of one India narrative that we see right now, which yeah. will, I'm, I'm sorry to say, which, which is again a major ingredient in actually diminishing the chances of proper real peace and lasting peace right. in. It is ironical, isn't it, that the two neighboring states, in one case, they almost have a parallel trajectory. In one case, it works. In one case, it festers on. And even this December, we've had that terrible killing of uh, civilians uh, by the army by mistake in uh, in uh, Nagaland. But let, let's move a little ahead. Of, of course, after that, you had the 1975 Shillong Accord. There are various uh, um, elements and various attempts, but also a complexity came in when the, the rebel movement itself in Nagaland got kind of splintered with the Kaplang faction, the Isaac Muiva faction, and others. Now, uh, the other interesting thing, and this is what I don't understand, so I'd love to understand from you. So uh, as I understand it, in Myanmar, there is a Naga autonomous region, uh, which has been given some kind of a status in 2008 uh, in, in a small pocket. Uh, over here, you don't. So how does that add to the complexity, if at all? Uh, the factionalism and this uh, this little region in Myanmar. Well, actually, you know, I'm glad you bring that up, but you know, the Nagas of India have way more than the Nagas of Myanmar always have. I mean, that's the, that's something that we also need to acknowledge. It is that within the dynamics of the rebel movement, it hasn't. So let me lay this out for you very quickly. Uh, yeah. Myanmar in northern and northwestern Myanmar, you have had. Factions, you have the Wa people, you have the Kachin, you have the, you know, you have the Karen rebels in the east, so on and so forth. You have the Naga rebels, and you have the Chin rebels, uh, you know, sort of the Arakan rebels, so on and so forth. So, like in India, the government of Myanmar uh, over several decades have had wars with these people, have entered into negotiations with these people, and in many occasions, like with the Wa, Wa people in the Shan autonomous region, they've entered into deals basically, where you're saying that you run your own autonomous region, but we will not fight basically. So in that sense, uh, the Myanmar government of the day, 2008 and also 2012, they entered into an agreement with the NSC and Kaplan faction, which, which basically allowed them to uh, live their, you know, run their own sort of parallel government within the Naga within the territory that in the Sagaing division, which is east of both Nagaland and Manipur, it's entirely adjacent to that contiguous areas that you, you run your own show. But in India, since 1963, we've had the state of Nagaland, a federal unit mm -hmm. with its own legislature, right? With its own MLAs. You've had within the state of Manipur, which was born later. Uh, you have issues with that, you know, the Naga people in Manipur, like the Kuki people and the Mar people and the Zomi people, uh, complain, have always complained, and to my mind, rightfully so, that the majority people in Manipur, the Mete, uh, and the Plains people have sort of not given as much to the hills, hill people, where the Nagas, Kukis, the Mar, and the Zomi people live. But they've been represented in Manipur's assembly. They have 20 seats to the 40 seats in the plains in Manipur 60 seat assembly, which are going to the polls in the next few days, uh, in, in, at the end of February and early March, uh, as you know, if you will. And uh, in Assam, they, they're part of the Kachar district. In Arunachal Pradesh, they're part of the district of uh, Chirap and uh, you know, uh, Changlang and Tirap, mm -hmm. right? So these are represented in, in, in the assembly. So the people in these areas, territories, have been represented under the Indian system. It is the rebel construct. Mm. Since 1963, some, a big group of rebels didn't agree with the 1960 peace accord, which led to the creation of Nagaland state in 1963. So you had a schism there between what was called the accordists and the non-accordists. Mm. Then you had the Shillong agreement of 1975, which led to its own subspecies of accordists and non-accordists. The non-accordists evolved into NSCN, which then split into NSCN, IM, and NSCN, K. Gosh. And it, then it, over the years, into many as numerous other factions. So this non-being and this non-belonging has been driven not necessarily by the people of Naga land, mm. who have moved on and 
they have moved on against all odds with great fortitude, with great confidence and great a sense of ambition and need and belonging and a great sense of pride in the, in the Naga identity. Sure. That sure. we will move and we will make the best we can and they've stood up to India whenever it's, they have. With, and there have been huge issues, uh, but I'm just giving you the broad outline. Right. But it's a rebel construct that has had an issue with this. So they've been a non accordance So while <laughs> you have a rebel then... government running a parallel government, sorry to parallel yeah. government and, and fighting for the cause of the people, you've ironically had a government of Nagaland, the government of Manipur with its MLAs, autonomous hill councils in these three, four states, and you've had a full, fully fledged state of Nagaland, right? Part of the union budget, part of the union planning, part right. of the union everything that is lit. So it's it's bizarre, and the government of India is singularly responsible to permit for the sake of ceasefire from 1997 onwards, and then subsequently for the sake of the framework agreement that was signed between Mr. Muiva, Mr. Ravi in the presence of the NSA, Ajit Doval, and the Prime Minister himself, and the Home Minister, Rajnath Singh, uh, the government of India is singularly responsible for allowing the Naga rebel construct to continue with their uh, parallel governments that, as we speak, can still recruit, arm, train, intervene, in the Indian political context. But why is that? Why are they allowing the rebel uh, leaders to have so much say? Because you're absolutely right. So the the Nagaland is mainstream today. You know, you've got the great Hornbill festivals. The youngsters are all over. But the fact is that you know the rebels are are getting a lot of attention, a lot of uh, support. And I'm going to link my next question with that. But the abrogation of Article 370 and 35A in Kashmir, uh, which was the same logic that was used, that one part of that state is holding back the development of all of the others. Indeed. The abrogation of that, what impact is that having on um, Nagaland? Because yeah. press reports suggest that it's the framework agreement that is holding it back right now because uh, you know uh, it's, it's going against the grain of it. So please make sense of this for us. Okay, three very quick points. One is that uh, the, the, the to, to, to close a loop on the why India permits this parallel government, because India has always adopted, not just in Nagaland or the Naga homelands or Manipur elsewhere, a policy of managing a conflict rather than solving a conflict. That has been the mantra. And it has been the divide and rule, sort of the Chanakya Niti, you know, done, paid, so on and so forth, has been applied rigorously in all aspects of uh, conflict resolution. You can't apply Chanakya Niti as a, as a driving force of conflict resolution. That's cynical, right? And, and here, so you do that on one side. You keep creating factions, split, split, split. You play on the egos of rebel leadership. Split, split. So that's another story. But India is paying the price of that. You just have way too many factions, right? Right? Whether it's been engineered by Chanakiniti or it's been engineered by rebel leadership egos, which is also true. Right? Uh, but you've had this as a policy, a studious policy by the government of India of managing conflict. When you want to manage conflict, you can't necessarily solve a conflict. You have to come to the point where you want to actively solve a conflict. In that sense, the framework agreement is a fine piece of intent. The flaw that I find in the framework agreement, which I uh, saw it even as it was happening, and I wrote about it immediately after, and I've spoken about it, written about it, including in this book, The Eastern Gate, is that it was hugely flawed because the framework agreement was a deal signed with one Naga rebel group, not all Naga rebel groups. It did not include the civil society of Nagaland. It did not include the political leadership of Nagaland. It did not include the civil society of Manipur, Assam, or Arunachal Pradesh. It did not include the political leadership or the political establishments of these three states. It did not involve the chief ministers of these three states. When the ceremony happened, the chief ministers of Nagaland, Assam, Manipur, and uh, you know, uh, and Arunachal Pradesh were not present. There was there were no there was no society. There was no 
civil leadership or political leadership from these, how do you move? And, and no other factions either. So it was yeah. inherently flawed, deeply flawed from the first instance. And then I think reality dawned. And then by 2027, 2017, other factions began to be brought on board with a parallel political discussion, but parallel to IAM, because IAM was by then showcased to such an extent that it would seem that it would be you know, like a climb down, a loss of face for Mr. Muiwa and IAM, with then to be seen as another rebel group, rather right. than the sole voice of the Naga people, which they had projected themselves to be until then, right? So then you had the process coming in, you had parallel streams coming in, you had the other factions being brought on board, and you had discussions, active discussions with civil society, with the chief ministers, with uh, the church leadership, uh, very, very necessary, with the tribal leadership, Tribes is a very key aspect of the Naga homelands. You have to talk to the tribes. You have to talk to the women. The women are many the strongest elements to a construct of peace and prosperity in this region as any other region in the world. And you leave the women out, they are a linchpin of peace. I mean, the government of India and the rebel leadership left everybody out. Now, but slowly, this is being rectified. What happens now? What happens now okay. after the 70th? Okay. Now, now the, uh, so that is, now, now we come to that, the final point of the last series of questions. Article 35A, when it was abrogated in Jammu Kashmir, uh, pursuant to uh, getting rid of uh, uh, Article 370. But we tend to forget that in the northeast of India, each state, particularly Nagaland, uh, um, Assam, Manipur, Arunachal Pradesh, Mizoram, Tripura to some extent, have articles 371 A, B, C, D, H, J, and so on and so forth, which provide their particular benefits to that particular state. Now, article 371 A that applies to Nagaland was a result of, was evolved out of the Naga peace process in 1960, was ingrained into the constitution of India as an amendment, and 371 A came to be, which, uh, which which guaranteed the Naga land, the people of Naga land, uh, no payment of personal income tax, protection of uh, custom, customary laws would prevail, uh, the land would belong to the tribes, land would belong to the people, so on and so forth. And there was a provision also that the Naga people would gain primacy, which had primacy in jobs and in economic benefits and in development. And the non-Naga people, the people, who are not from Nagaland were by application of the inner line permit and various other uh, matters kept away from these benefits to protect the people of Nagaland, to protect the people of Manipur, to protect the people of Arunachal Pradesh, and so on and so forth. Now, when you abrogate, when you get rid of Article 371A, more particularly Article 35A in Jammu and Kashmir, which guarantees the people, which guaranteed the people of Jammu and Kashmir almost identical provisions as guaranteed by Article 371A in Nagaland, for instance. How can you then say that, you know, it's not okay for the people of Kashmir because it's holding back uh, development, Article 35A, so we have to get rid of it, and you create this huge political storm and justify this bifurcation of Kashmir into JNK and Ladakh, into Union territories, and yet encourage a 35A like article, which is 371A in Nagaland, and praise 371A as being fabulous and absolutely the best thing that happened to Nagaland. And therefore, you have 37, 371A, why are you complaining? Because you have everything you need. You have all the guarantees. So, you know, we as a government of India, and here I'm saying we, I'm speaking as an Indian citizen, as are you, uh, we mean well, we believe in the future. It is the bedrock of the of the making of modern India series is born from that faith in our past, present, and future. Now, when you and I come from that platform and that belief system in a syncretic, liberal, progressive, peace and, peace and prosperity for everybody in India kind of belief, and you look at this schizoid political behavior by the government of India in the most active manner, you are creating a recipe for ongoing chaos. You're not creating a recipe 
for solutions. So it was natural when 35A was aggregated. So people in the Northeast went uh, ballistic. They were concerned. So you then were, you had to buy them out by political, with political subs saying, no, no, we guarantee this will happen. But then uh, the people in Kashmir said, but what about us? Because you know, you're giving them that, uh, but this is 35A. And the government said, oh, you know, you are anti-national and we put you in jail. We'll you know, put you it's under really, house arrest really for months and wheels. months on end. Yeah, it's, it's really wheels. So, you know, wheels. It's, you know they, this yeah. brings me back to, to, to yeah. rooting it back to where we started, the making of modern India. Um, so this is a wonderful yeah. look at one of the longest running conflicts within India, in Nagaland. As we celebrate 75 years of independence, it's also time to say that let's, let's move ahead. Yes. If civil society has moved ahead, if the polity has moved ahead, maybe we should move ahead. Now, you've studied this space so much. You have looked at what needs to be done. Tell me, what are the solutions that, you know, often it's, it's, it's the solutions that are faced, uh, staring at you in your face, right, at the ground. Uh, you make a lovely point, I think, in page 94, because I marked it out. But you said that why don't you just give them basic infrastructure? The roads are bad. Everything is broken over. Yeah. In, in yeah. Yeah. At least yeah. give them the dignity of life. Yeah. Get them get development out there, and that could be the answer itself. You know, where there is growth, where there is a visibility of a of a better life. My question is how how can one found? Do you see a solution coming through? What needs to be done, especially with the larger the elephant in the room being China, which is our neighbor, and this is going to be. Uh, 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 the next couple of decades are going to be about India and China, really, and the region is going to be a hot spot. So, how do you see this all panning out? Well, the, the, that's that's very that's very good, Vinny, because you know we uh, we must be looking at this region in an active way, and the solutions are very simple. I mean, unfortunately, the Northeast of India has also incorporated, absorbed the worst elements of political corruption. Uh, now, uh, ironically, the northeast of India, the states of northeast India, count among the most corrupt states of India, bar none, in terms of degree of corruption. Uh, and um, ir ironically, these are the this is the political leadership of the states who are ethnically from these areas, who are robbing their own people of vibrant futures. Today, if the roads in Nagaland are awful and the roads in Manipur are non-existent and hospitals and schools and so on and so forth are not built for years on end, and the CAG, the Comptroller and uh, Auditor General of India, write the most scathing reports about all states of Northeastern India, the government of India is, I think, partly to blame, but the other part of the blame lies with the leadership of this, these, these states who have absorbed gleefully and completely the worst uh, ideals of corruption from what is called mainland India. So that needs to be solved. The, I'm very happy to state that, say that there is a great sense of accountability that is beginning to grow in states like Nagaland, where you have, you know, sort of the old guard, if you will, who are put placed against the wall by a new generation of political leaders who are coming into the forefront, who are questioning the old political leadership and holding them accountable for every uh, infraction uh, of their uh, lack of infrastructure, lack of development, degree of corruption in every sphere of life, so on and so forth. Now, this is crucial, meaning, because this is where development is then seen by the citizens at large, and that's what they want. I mean, who wants to be in a conflict situation for decades on end? People want to move on, they see their life, and that's where the look east policy which morphed uh, which was announced in 1994 by Narasimha Rao's government and then it was recast in uh, 2015 by Mr Modi as the act east policy uh, in November 2014 as as uh, act east policy uh, this is the area which is the uh, the crucible for the act east policy it is the sort of the pivot for act east policy now, it all needs to come together. You have geopolitics coming together, geoeconomics coming together, you have regional development coming together, you have regional communications coming together in terms of roads, communications, links, energy grids, waterways, 
from Myanmar through northeastern India through Bangladesh into eastern India. I mean, this, these are works in these are works in progress. Now, you cannot have an act east policy by overlooking the northeast of India. Yeah, it is incumbent that these two run in tandem. So it is necessary for the people of this region and the government of India and the administrations of India and the governments of these states, Nagaland, Manipur, and elsewhere. Tripura is a case in point, Mizoram, Arunachal, Manipur, Assam, to you know, sort of do for their people, which they claim to have been doing all these years, which they blame India for not doing for all these decades. 90% and more of the budgetary allocation and the non-plan expenditure, for instance, of Nagaland and Manipur is provided by the central government. It is eaten and bleached and leaked by the governments of these states. They have to step up to the plate as well. So it becomes incumbent on many players, many levels of society and politics and governance to work together and including the rebel leadership, the present rebel leadership, which claim to work for the people, they need to be integrated into the uh, political framework. I wouldn't say integrated fully because it's a politically loaded term, but there are examples all over the world, examples in Nepal, examples in Assam, in Mizoram, in Rwanda, you name it, these are examples where you give the rebel leadership an honorable out, you give the rebel cadres an honorable out, integrate themselves them into paramilitary forces, retrain them, give them loans, which are template uh, situations in India and South Asia and elsewhere in the world, uh, bring them, make them part of the system. I won't call it the mainstream or integration, bring them in, bring the leadership into the process. Nagaland, the Naga peace process is actually considering a bicameral legislature, two, two step legislature in Nagaland to expand the number of MLAs so that the rebel leadership can be accommodated. There right. is talk about deal limitation in Manipur so that the constituencies can increase, rebel leadership can come in. So there are these works in progress, but the rebel leadership are being adamant because I, I, they I have think a it's about life. intent, as, as you said, it's hmm. about uh, all the players, the stakeholders coming yeah. in to, together yeah. and saying, instead of managing the conflict, let's yes. resolve yeah. it and solve it. And I think um, that is the key. And, you know, as we look at India at 75 and look at the 100 years that shaped India, I think it's very yeah. important uh, to understand this crisis and also bring this to the public domain, uh, Sudeep. Indeed. Indeed. The other problem is that people don't understand it. Uh, people uh, outside the Northeast or people not, uh, you know, closely connected with the Northeast don't yeah. understand it. And I think you've uh, put the case very eloquently and uh, done a fabulous job with the books that you have uh, worked on. Thank and you. thanks for joining us today, Sudeep. To take us My absolute pleasure. My absolute pleasure, Nini. Thank you. Thank you.